our Father, if ever we love thee, we love thee right now. Help us to love you more. I pray, Lord, that as we assemble together tonight that you will manifest your presence in a way that we've not felt it before. We're in trouble, Lord, and only Jesus can be our present help in the time of trouble. And so I plead with thee, Lord, to abide with us now, we pray and we thank you. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight's Wednesday night. We only have a few nights left in this session. We are just getting to the foundation of what we should be studying. We're at least a day and a half behind. I don't know if we ever catch up, but we'll give as much as we can. I believe that we need to take advantage of the time we have. What do you say? I've been praying, dear God, give me words that would help us to awaken. We cannot treat this like another week of prayer. We cannot treat this as this, if every time a week of prayer comes, we're just going to do the same thing. This has to be different. There has to be a radical change. There has to be made up in our mind that we're saying, dear God, I cannot remain the way that I was. There has to be a difference. And Jesus wants to make us different. What do you say? Brothers and sisters, we don't have time, much time left in this world. If you've been noticing what we've been studying, you see that we have very little time left. And whatever we do, we must do quickly. In fact, if you'll take your Bibles, and you'll take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 12. 1 Chronicles 12. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. 1 Chronicles, the 12th chapter. 1 Chronicles 12. Now, what is the greatest thing that we can do right now? And if we're trying to get ready for this crisis, what is the greatest thing we can do right now? Talk to me. We must get to know God. Not in some casual way, but, but the acronym is what? C-I-P. What does it stand for? C stands for what? Close. I stands for what? Intimate. P stands for what? Personal. That's the type of relationship that we must have. Now, in order to understand or know Jesus like this, we've got to understand his plan because the beauty of the plan reveals the beauty of the man. Now, the plan of redemption has three great purposes. How many? Three. Three. Now, there are many things we can study in the plan of redemption. We will be studying it through the ceaseless ages of eternity. But the plan of redemption has three great purposes. The first great purpose of the plan of redemption is to reveal the character of God. What is the first purpose? To reveal the character of God. Now, you don't have to be afraid to talk. We're, we're teaching, so don't be afraid. You can talk. The first great purpose of the plan of redemption is to reveal the character of God. And God is love. His nature, his government, his law, everything about God is love. It, ever, it always has been and ever will be. Every manifestation of creative power is an expression of the love of God. Every time we see the beauty of a sunrise, every time we see the beauty of a sunset, did you see the sunset a few days ago? It was beautiful, brothers and sisters. Every time you smell the fragrance of a flower or see the sweet or see the bird and hear his lovely song is in token that God is smiling at you and me. God loves us, brothers and sisters. He doesn't want us to be lost. God does not want the worst sin in this world to be lost. He's made provision through the plan of redemption that we can be saved. I don't care how many sins there are. Someone says, but you don't understand. Look at my dark life of sin. Listen, when you look at yourself, you'll be discouraged. But when you look at Jesus, you'll be encouraged. When you look at yourself, you'll see that there looks like you're hopeless. When you look at Jesus, you'll see that there's no way that you can be lost. And the devil's plan is to keep us from understanding the character of God. Because God is love. In fact, he said, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have ever everlasting life. I say, praise God. What do you say? Amen. That's the first great purpose of God's plan of redemption. It's to reveal God's character and God is what? Love. What is the first purpose of the plan of redemption? To do what? To reveal. to reveal the character of God and God is love. The second great purpose of the plan of redemption is to reveal the exceeding sinfulness of sin. To do what? To reveal. To reveal. I can't hear you. To do what? To reveal, to reveal the exceeding sinfulness 
of sin. Well, what does that mean? In other words, the purpose of the plan of redemption means to make sin appear what it really is. You see, the devil has a way of putting makeup on sin and making sin look like something that it is not. And so the majority of the world, when they look at sin, they look at sin as if it's attractive, as if it is it's drawing, as if it's something that's wonderful about it, it seems pleasurable, but it's only because makeup is on it. You know, all the makeup artists are not in Hollywood. The devil is the greatest makeup artist in this world. You know, a lot of times I used to put up a slide, I don't put up anymore, but I used to put up a slide, and you have some of these uh, so-called stars that so many people in America look up to around the world. And you have these entertainment stars and, and, and they say, oh, they're so handsome when they look at the men or the women. Oh, they're so beautiful. But a lot of what you see is not even them, it's Photoshop. A lot of what you see is not the person, it's makeup. And, and it's amazing. I have one picture with the artist that you look at and you say, oh, they look so nice. And then the next uh, picture, I had the makeup on, the next picture I show the same person side by side and take the makeup off and you say, oh! It's the makeup. Do you know right now that there are some women that they will not let their husband see them without putting makeup on first? You know, there's some people, some, some women wake up early in the morning before the husband wake up, put the makeup on so that the husband thinks that what he's looking at is his wife. And the reality is, I'm sorry to say, sad to say, but the reality is, if many men had seen their wife without the makeup on and all the false things that she puts on, he would say, no way, I will marry you. He said, what? He get a, a, a pastor make him say, what? I, I thought you were like this. I thought that was yours. But then all of a sudden he started saying, when uh, uh, I marry that is makeup. But it's not just the women. You used to think only the women wear, wear, wear more makeup. Now the men wearing makeup. Someone said, oh, the men putting makeup? Not, 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 not like that. You know, sometimes the, 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 the men have a way of putting on some different clothes and suits and they make them look better than they look. In fact, when a man gets married, you know he puts that tuxedo on. You know what I'm talking about. And when he puts that tuxedo on, most people think the tuxedo is talking about the tux, but that's not what it is. When you get after the, the, the wedding night and the honeymoon, the tuxedo comes off and you see there's a lot of things tucked away that the wife didn't know was there. All of a sudden, something comes rolling out and she says, I married that. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that many men and women would not get married if they saw each other as they really were? And my brothers and sisters, the reason why we're married and addicted and attracted to sin is not because of what sin really is. It's because of the makeup that the devil has put on sin. And the purpose of the plan of redemption is to take the makeup off of sin so that we can see it as it really is hideous, ugly. Then we have enmity, hatred for sin, and we would rather die than hold on to it. The problem is we don't see sin as it really is. And you know that many will not see sin for what it is until after the thousand year period. When they're lost, they're going to look into the pearly gates. They're going to see transparent, look in and saw that they missed out of heaven for nothing. Can you imagine you saying, I missed out of heaven for a job and the job's not even paying you much money. I missed out of heaven for a car, or for a house, or for a rap song, or a rap CD, or for some girlfriend or boyfriend. What are they? Nothing. What should it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? My brothers and sisters, the first great purpose of the plan of redemption is that God wants to reveal his character, and God is love. The second great purpose of the plan of redemption is to reveal the exceeding sinfulness of sin. It's to take the makeup off of sin so that we can see it as it is and hate it. How many did I tell you I was going to give you tonight? Three. Three. How many did I give you? Three. How many more do you need? One. Well, there's one more purpose. First purpose, reveal the character of God. God is love. Second purpose is to reveal the exceeding sinfulness of sin, to show us what sin and how ugly it really is. But the third and great purpose of the plan of redemption is to give us an understanding of the time so that we can understand what to do and embrace the spirit of urgency. Notice First Chronicles chapter 12. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. First Chronicles 12. Are you there? Amen. Let's read verse 32 together. What does the Bible say in 1 Chronicles 12, verse 32? The Bible says, and the children of what? Issachar. 1 Chronicles 12. You should be in 1 Chronicles 12. I don't hear you. You must not be there. 1 Chronicles 12 and verse 32. You're there, amen? amen? Let's read that together. What does it say? And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had what? Amen. Understanding of the... That's what the plan of redemption does. It gives an understanding of the time. What for? To know what Israel what? 
ought to do. Now, is there a relationship between knowing the time and knowing what to do? Yes or no? Do you know, brothers and sisters, that that's the most practical thing in the world? Let me try to make it plain and practical tonight. There's a relationship between knowing the time and knowing what to do. That inspiration tells us, Heavenly Father, we plead for you tonight to let nothing distract us. If there's anyone on the outside, that they'll come in quickly. And that, Lord, we will have our ears and eyes open to hear the lovely voice of Jesus. Please, dear God, grant us your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us there's a relationship between knowing the time and knowing what to do. Is there a relationship? The Bible says, listen now, at one o'clock this morning, were you coming to this church? No. You were? No. Why not? It wasn't time. You see, time regulates what we do. You know that timing regulates our diet. In fact, what were you eating last night at 1 a.m. in the morning? What were you eating? I hope nothing. You see, brothers and sisters, there's a time to eat and a time not to eat. Do you know that, 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 that the time even regulates the article of food on the plate? There are things that we eat at breakfast time that we do not eat at lunch time or that we do not eat at dinner time because there's a relationship between the time and what we eat. There's a relationship not only between time and eating, but there's a relationship between time and what we wear. Tell me something. What were you wearing last night at midnight? Were you wearing what you have on right now? I hope not. There are bedtime clothes. There is work time clothes. There is church time clothes. That timing regulates everything that we do. Do you know that our worship is regulated by time? This is why we're seven Adventists. The Bible says six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, but the seven day time. Worship him. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that the entire seven-day Adventist message is based on time? The three angels' messages. The first angel starts and says, fear God and give glory to him for the what? Hour or time of his judgment has come. Therefore, glorify God. My brothers and sisters, whether it's eating or drinking or dressing or music or worship or life, everything is regulated by time. Why? Because the Bible says to everything there is a season. And a time to every purpose under the heaven. So timing regulates everything we do. And if we understand the time, we will know what to do. But if we don't understand the time, we won't know what to do. We'll be confused. And instead of becoming the friend of God, we'll remain his enemy. And guess what? We don't have much time to learn it. In fact, we found that we're approaching what inspiration calls the beginning of the talk to me. When does the Bible tell us that the events that mark the beginning of the end will take place? Talk to me. I can't hear you. 2020, how long did, 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 did the, the men of this world said that it's going to be developing, developing, developing? What did they say? We showed you last night from the Bible, they're not far off. We showed you that this is about the time frame. Now, my brothers and sisters, we got to understand something. What about economy? I showed you that in every field of knowledge, whether it be science, whether it be historian, whether it be the politician, whether it be the, uh, the economist. In fact, let me show you what the economists say. Let me show you what the economist says. 2020, it says the year when what? Four long-term economic threats will what? Culminate. When? What time? 2020. Now watch what they say. It says long-time correspondent asked me to elaborate on my recent reference of the real crisis being pushed forward to what? Now the long answer would fill an entire volume, so I'll attempt to give you a shorthand version. We don't have enough time to go through all of it. Now, my brothers and sisters, notice what he says. He begins to start talking about it, and he talks about, he wrote a book called The Fourth Turning, describing the four generations. And he showed that all of it cycles, and that we have a great crisis in 2020. Now, notice what he says here. He says, there is what? Nothing, Nothing magical about what? Or about his crisis. In other words, it's not the date. It's not the number. It's the fact that something, events are happening that make 2020 become critical. Are you with me? We must understand the coming events. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is not only economy. Every field of knowledge shows that we're headed toward extinction. Now, my brothers and sisters, look at what this says. This is another newspaper called Huffington Post. It says, let's read it together. What did it say? 2030. This is what? The end. Will it really be the end? Like the Doors were telling us back in the 70s. Now the Doors, they were a rock group in the 70s. And they had a song called The End. Uh, and, and it says, today we have enough 
ideas. Is that what they say? What does that say right there? Data. What does data mean? That means you're making up something. What does data mean? There's data, information. There's understanding. There's knowledge. There's evidence. It says we have enough data about our ecosystem to make sound decisions that could potentially shift the needle slightly toward the better end. It says in a world where most of us do not have, what's the next word? Time to read. You know what we're going to find out the problem is? The reason why most of us have never heard about what's happening in all these fields of knowledge because we don't have time to read. It says if we had time to read, studies, it would explain that, what, that number, what is that number? What is, talk to me. 2030 is the year of a major shift in our what? Planetary systems. We have to question ourselves as to what comes next. See, there are many studies on every field of knowledge that are telling us 2030 is a major shift in every field of knowledge. Now, why don't we know it? We don't have time. We're so busy looking at everything else, doing everything else. It says, for the past 42 years, Danella Meadows, Jurgen Randers, and Dennis Meadows spent their time explaining that 2030 was the expected year for a planetary system what? Not just an economic collapse. That happened in 2008. We're still in it. What this collapse in 2030 uh, that, that, that they're talking about is much more than just an economic collapse. It's a planetary collapse. In their book called Limits of Growth, it says it's not another what? Dot com bubble or financial crisis. No, it's a what? System. In other words, the whole system that we call society is destroyed. It says not enough what? Food to feed us all due to depleted soil. No more fish to catch due to ocean acidification and overfishing activities. Not enough drinkable water. No more water. Why? All due to what? Pollution and climate change and over what? Population. No more raw materials or resources to keep pace of our throughput based industrial system and so on and on and on. In other words, that everything falls apart at this time. Now, why is it that in 2030, everything in the earth begins falling apart if you understood what we studied tonight? Because what happens when something comes to its limit? When a car gets ready to come to its limit, what starts happening to all the systems of the car? Brakes stop working. The pressure in the engine stops working. All of the systems stop working. What happens uh, in a cell phone when it comes to the term of its limit? What starts taking place? Everything starts breaking down. What happens, brothers and sisters, when you come inside of a system that's about to come to an end? That means that as we approach the limit of the 6,000 year, everything in the earth should start falling apart. Do we see it today? Yes or no? Yes. It says... That this has been identified, it says, but guess what it says? The limits of the growth explain countless times that we cannot go on beyond the earth's carrying capacity without heading toward a major what? Cliff. That one that will see a tragic and endless decline in world population. And we're talking about three to four, p four to billion people doing what? Dying. Most certainly the weakest and the poorest first. Who has rejected the st strong warning call. Others, highly regarded institutes in the world, such as the American scientists, have talked about this, but guess what? The thing is, we're not programmed to address long-term what? Challenge. But it is disastrous for our species, talking about humanity. We are too optimistic about stories. Was it that way in the Titanic, yes or no? Oh, yeah. This is our problem. We think, oh, things are going to fix itself. The, the scientists will do it. The politicians will do it. The religious leaders will do it. The world will do it. The church will do it. And don't recognize that we're headed toward a cliff. My brothers and sisters, somebody must make up their mind. i never forget hearing about a story of, a, a, of an airplane line. The airline that was flying, and then all of a sudden it crash landed. And nobody died. It crash landed. And they landed on the runway, slid, and stopped. And as they stopped, they were waiting for the persons that tell them what to do. You know, you land, you bung, you bung down, and you're waiting for somebody to tell you, take the seatbelt off, do this, do that, and they're waiting, they're listening. Nothing happens. A minute goes by, nothing takes place. Some people in the back get a little antsy. The majority of people looking back, they said, sit down, we're waiting for the news come, they're waiting for an alarm to go off. Then all of a sudden, a few more people, some brave souls say, you know what, we're not waiting for anything. They said, don't you see that smoke? They then got up and nobody would move. They, would, they were standing in the seats in the aisles. And so persons stood over them, climbed over seats into the railways, got out of, their, uh, out of their plane. And the majority stayed on the airplane waiting for the pilot. And they didn't know he was already dead. Mm -hmm. Waiting for the uh, uh, flight attendants dead. 
And all of a sudden, brothers and sisters, when those few, they couldn't even grab their bags because they couldn't take it out. When they got out on the runway just far enough from the plane, the plane exploded. And the majority died because they were frozen and paralyzed. They would not move, waiting for a man to have a board meeting to tell them what to do. And my brothers and sisters, do you know the Seven Heavens Church, we are following the same experience. It was that way in North Flood. They waited for the world to get ready. We're so used to looking at what everybody does, looking at the numbers, waiting for someone else to take it serious before we take it serious. My friends, that type of program is going to cause a man to lose his life. If you are going to get ready and I'm going to get ready, we've got to say like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, brothers and sisters, I don't know what you're going to do, but by God's grace, I want to get ready for the coming of the Lord. What do you say? And so we're going to stop and get into our message. We didn't finish yesterday, but we got to go forward. We're going to take a little bit forward and try to blend another message in it. Tonight, we're going to try to talk about a bell and a pomegranate. A what? A bell and a pomegranate. But before we do, I think that it's evident we need Jesus. We're approaching, brothers and sisters, the beginning of the end, and it's not going to start in 2030. We found out, brothers and sisters, that the first milestone is not 2030. The first milestone is what? And that's not a long ways away. Whatever we do, we've got to do quickly. And so, brothers and sisters, before we go deeper into our study this evening, I think we need to talk to God and ask him to give us his spirit. What do you say? And so before we do, we said that we'll spend time every night talking to Jesus. How long? Is it a long time? No. We want to spend time talking to Jesus. And so if you're reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer, forget this congregation, let's kneel and talk to God. Ask him to get our hearts ready. And after two moments of silent prayer, we'll get into the message this evening, a bell and a pomegranate. Forget this congregation. Talk to Jesus about your heart, your home, and let's get ready for the coming of the Lord. Talk to Jesus. Oh, Father in heaven, we have never, never needed you as much as we needed you right now. Father, we seem paralyzed. We seem, Lord, to be moving in slow motion. We can see the signs and the handwriting, but Lord, we're moving so slow. It's like a dream or a nightmare. We're trying to run and we can't move. We're making commitments and decisions to wake up in the morning and pray, and we're getting later and later every day. We're making decisions, Lord, that we're going to change what we put into our bodies and what we do and think so that we can develop a relationship with you. But dear God, the devil is continually trapping us in a cycle of slavery and we want you to break it for us today. Father, we don't want to remain in that same careless, casual state. We want to have the spirit of urgency that would move us by your grace to make radical changes before it is too late. Don't allow us to sit in the plane of life until it explodes when we all could have moved instead of waiting for the church to tell us to wake up. May we hear the voice of God speaking to our souls. I pray, Lord, that you will give us as much of the Holy Spirit as we can accept tonight without being consumed by your presence. I pray, dear God, that you will so fill this church that even those who drive by and pass by will feel that you're in this place. I plead, dear God, that you would help us to stop playing games, that talking mouths will be hushed, that any distracted mind will be fixed and focused, that our great need is for a revival and reformation through Jesus Christ. 
I plead, dear God, that you remove me. You see that I'm weak and feeble and frail. I need you, dear God. Give me your wisdom, your spirit, your love, so that we can understand what we need in this last hour before it is too late. Help us to understand, Lord, that there's a great work that must happen in a little time. And help us to understand the meaning of a bell and a pomegranate. Please abide with us, Lord, tonight we pray. For we ask it all in the beautiful name, in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you will take your Bibles and turn to the book of Matthew, the seventh chapter, to the book of Matthew, chapter seven. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen, we're turning to the book of Matthew, the seventh chapter. What book did I say? Matthew. What chapter are we going to? Seven. That's a special chapter, special number. We're going to Matthew, chapter seven. Now, brothers and sisters, we're living tonight in a time where the majority of mankind has lost a sense of the value of a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're living tonight in a day and hour where the majority of mankind, both of youth and adults, have more interest in the internet than in entering into a relationship with our loving Lord. And this should concern us. Why? Because the Bible says in the last days that this is a sign. That in the last days that the love of many shall wax cold and we see this happening in this generation. I mean, there never was a generation where the love has waxed so cold as it does tonight. I remember reading a story the, uh, some time ago where a woman was in the convenience store. She goes into the store, gets into an altercation in the line. While she does, someone gets, breaks out into a fight. They knock her down, stab her. She falls on the ground, blood oozing out. And as she's dying in the pool of blood, someone comes over her with a cell phone and takes a picture of her. How can we wonder if we're living in the last days? The Bible says in the last days, the love of many would wax cold. This is the generation that we're living in. A day and hour where man has more of a love of pleasure, more than he loves God. And the Bible says this is a sign of the last days. And is that not true of this generation? We love pleasure more than we love God. I mean, think of it. We spend hours on cell phones, hours watching movies, hours on internet, hours on social media, Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook and all this other foolishness. Hours we spend there. But when it comes to the Bible, we barely even spend five minutes. No time for prayer. No time for study. No time for worship. No time for witnessing. No time for weeks of prayer. And it's a shame. The church was open for a week and there are more visitors than church members. That's a rebuke, brothers and sisters. Something's wrong with us. And then you know, if we're lost, if we're part of this church, pillars of faith, and we're lost with a name like that, having a name but being dead, if we're lost, God is going to say, you had a whole week, but you were so busy, you were more interested in singing and getting your jobs ready and getting your life ready than in getting ready for the coming of the Lord. And I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. You're going to see that it wasn't a man just standing here. It was angels prodding us, go to the meetings, study, pray, worship, get ready. Why? Time is running out and we're wasting it. My brothers and sisters, do you understand that Jesus is trying to speak and give final warnings to Atlanta and we're watching these warnings and like in the Titanic, like in the plane, we're watching them and thinking we're going to have more time. My brothers and sisters, we see that time is culminating. And do you know one of the saddest facts? One of the saddest facts of all the Bible, when you study its sacred pages from Genesis to Revelation, one solemn and sad fact is this, that the majority of God's people have never been ready for a crisis. Never. From Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning of time to the end of time, that 99% have been unready and less than 1% of God's professed people have ever been ready in a crisis. How do I know? Look at the examples. I mean, think, brothers and sisters, look at the example. In fact, look at the words of Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter 7. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Let's read verse 13 together. Matthew 7 verse 13. The Bible says, enter ye in at the what gate, everybody? Straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction and not a few. What did it say? And many there be which go there. In other words, the population, the majority are going to hell. Going in the wrong direction. And my brothers and sisters, notice what Jesus says in the next verse. Verse 14 says, because what? Straight is the gate. The message is straight. 
and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and not many, the Bible says, and what everybody? And few there be that find it. The majority are always going in the wrong direction. Now, my brothers and sisters, all you have to do is look at the history of the Bible. Look from Genesis to Revelation, beginning of time to the end of time, and you'll see it's always the same. Less than 1%. I defy the man that can show me a time in the Bible where the professed people of God in a crisis have had more than 1%. You can't do it. I mean, go back to the beginning of time. Look at Adam and Eve, the first people on the planet. When the crisis came at the tree, how many were prepared to stand? Not one. Zero percent. Look at the flood. Come down years later. Look at the flood. How many people on the earth on the, at the time of the flood? About how many? Talk to me. Seven billion. How many people on, the, on board the ark? They less than 1%. Look at Sodom and Gomorrah. Come down some years later. Look at Sodom and Gomorrah. A whole wicked city. Thousands in that wicked city. How many made it out? Three. Somebody said three. You know, three didn't even really make it out. No? Lot was there and his two daughters, his wife, when she tried to go out, she was so busy, caught up in her house. I can imagine her looking, living in Buckhead. Can you imagine that? Her, she was caught up in that house. She was caught up in all the cars and all of the fancy ideas. She was caught up in the material possessions. And Jesus said, remember what, Lot's wife? It's amazing. We will invest time and money and energy waking up at three and two and four for money and man, but not for God. And soon our soul will be lost. Now, my brothers and sisters, Lot and his two daughters continue to go out. But if you look at the night later on, you'll find out that they committed incest with their father. They didn't even make it out. And so when you go to the New Testament, the Bible doesn't even mention him. The Bible says in 2 Peter, it says the righteous soul of Lot was vexed. One. But even if you put three in that wicked city, how many came through Sodom and Gomorrah? Less than 1%. You come down to the Exodus and to the Babylonian captivity, thousands, tens of thousands went into Babylonian captivity. How many stood before the, uh, uh, fire and the fiery furnace? How many stood? Three. Ah, only three in the final furnace. There was another man named Daniel. He was away on some work at that time. But four altogether in Babylon. Tell me, brothers and sisters, less than how much? One percent. You come down to the first coming of Christ. Less than one percent were ready to welcome Jesus. Millions of Jews, but less than one percent ready to welcome him. Now, my brothers and sisters, <clears throat> why do we think in the last days it's going to be any different? How all of a sudden we're going to change in the last moments when we have been failing again and again from the first generation down here until the last generation. In fact, we are told that history and the last generation will be repeated. The majority, as Jesus said, will never make it. Not because we cannot, but because we don't take it serious. And all you have to do is look at this week of prayer and you can see for yourself. My brothers and sisters, the work of the church is the same way. Look at what the great controversy says. It says, as the storm approaches, a what? A large class would abandon their faith. And this reason says, and will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and shaking out of the seven Adventist church. Great controversy, 608. Now, I'm going to tell you, that large class, you know, the prophet told us that the seven Adventist church we're not talking. We're not talking. The seventh day of Heavenly Father, please, don't let us think that right now that we can be casual. Help us to see, Lord, from the first to the back that, Lord, this is our soul salvation, that you are talking to us, not a man. Help us to understand this, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to see, brothers and sisters, that the prophet tells us the prophet tells us that less than 1% of Seventh-day Adventists today that make up the Seventh-day Adventist church are going to go through that crisis. Less than 1%. 99% of us today who profess this are going to go through it. Why? We don't take it serious. It says a large class. Let's see how large the class. Volume 5, page 136. Let's read that together. It says, when the religion of Christ is most held, what's the next two words? In contempt. That's now. It says, when his law is most despised, then should our zeal be the what? warmest and our what's that next word courage you know that right now to be a minister today and to tell persons to listen to the straight truth no matter what they say somebody says well if i talk like that everybody hate me if i talk like that nobody would uh, like me brother and sister i can't care about that right now i care too much about your soul Amen. our soul is at stake and if i can't tell you the truth and give the trumpet a certain sound if you're lost your blood will be on my hands my brothers and sisters, look what this says. It says, then our, our zeal must be the warmest, our courage and firmness the most, what's that next word? Unflinching. 
That no matter what man says, that you will tell him the truth, unflinch, tell the man, be quiet, sit down, listen, study unflinchingly. Amen. My brothers and sisters, this says to stand, not sit, in defense of truth and righteousness when, what's the next two words? The majority do what? The majority of us are not going through. It says the majority are going to forsake the setting of the church. Now question, is that 50%? No. Majority is not 50%. Majority means that it has to be what? Over 50%. So the prophet is telling us to fight the champions of the Lord when champions are few. This will be our test. At this time, we must gather what? Warm from the corners of the... When other people get cold and say, oh, you're, you're just a fanatic extremist. I'm going to get away from you. Don't get mad. Don't get upset. Get some more warm from their coldness. It says, gather, gather not only warm from their coldness, but what? Courage from their what? Cowardice. As man is afraid to stand for God, God needs some men that are going to stand for God and stand for the right, though the heavens fall, whether man hears or forbears. Now, listen, it says, and loyalty from what? As many are leaving the Seventh Adventist Church now because they look at apostasy as hirelings leaving the church, starting their own stuff. God is looking for men that will stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us. It says the majority are going to do this. In other words, the prophet is telling us that there's going to be over 50% that's lost. Someone says, but that's not 99%. Well, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. Look what the prophet says. Vine 1, 466. I was shown that a most solemn work is where? Before us. It's a great work. Its importance and magnitude are what? We don't realize how important and how great the work is for us right now. It says, as I mark the, what's the next word? What is indifference? What does that mean? I don't care. Somebody said, I don't care what the minister's saying. This is what the prophet said. We'll be in the last days. She says, as I marked the indifference, which was what? Everywhere, not hidden. What was it? Apparent. Anytime that a man can hear a message from God and treat it carelessly, it's not hidden. It's apparent. It says, I was alarmed for what? Ministers, the preacher, and people, the congregation. Ministers and people are, what's the next word? unprepared for the time in which they live and not majority or 50 percent but what yes. question is 60 percent nearly all is 99 percent nearly all yes. it says nearly all who profess to believe present truth are unprepared in fact they are what holy what unfitted to receive what now I want to ask you a question in the last days in the last days if I don't receive the seal in the latter rain, am I going to make it through in the last days? Yes or no? Impossible. In fact, it says, they think they are what? All right. When they are what? All wrong. That's Laodicea. That's us. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked, but don't want to hear that. We want to hear that we're right increased with goods, but God is trying to tell us, please wake up. Now, my brothers and sisters, inspiration says that nearly what? We're getting closer to 99%. In fact, inspiration says, I saw a startling fact that but a small portion. Watch what the portion is. Last, last day of events, 172. It is a solemn statement. Not a, what, not a funny statement, but a what? Solemn. What does solemn mean? What does solemn mean? That means jumping up around, rejoicing? What is solemn? It's serious. Now, what solemn statement did the prophet make? She says, it is a solemn statement that I make to the church, not to the world, but to the what? Church. That not one in what? 20, whose names are registered upon the church books, are prepared to close their what? Earthly history. And would be as verily without God and without hope in the world as what? The common sinner. And the common sinner, if he doesn't accept Jesus, what's going to happen to him? He'll be lost if he doesn't accept Christ. So in the church, lost, it says, now I want to ask you a question. What percentage is 1 in 20? Now, I was told, Atlanta, you good mathematicians. Uh, what, what percentage? So who said that? Who said that? That's right. 5%. 1 in 20 is 5%. So if 5% is, if 5 were not ready, that would mean how many would be unready? 95%. But you know what this is? This doesn't say that 1 in 20 are ready. You know what this is? Not 1. So what this is telling us is that not 95% of the church are ready. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is what year? Talk to me. Question. You think we got better in 2019? Or you think we're worse and worse, as 2 Timothy 3 says? So if it's 
not, if it was not 95% then, do you think that we're closer to 99%? Yes or no? My brothers and sisters, they are not 99% of the church that's going to go through this crisis. In fact, it says not 1 in 20, but this last statement. Watch now, volume 1, 608. It says, in concluding this narrative, I would say that we're living in a most, what? Solemn time. In the last vision given me, the prophet says, I was, what? And this is serious. She was shown this. She says, I was shown not a fact, but the startling fact. Now, what does startling mean? It's shocking. Now, what I'm going to read is getting ready to be shocking. She says, I was shown not startling fiction. You know, sometimes fact can be stranger than fiction. And so I'm going to show you a startling fact, the prophet says. Now, watch what the fact is. Not a fiction, but a fact. It says, <clears throat> I was shown the startling fact that but a what? A small portion of those who now profess the truth now will be sanctified by it and be what? Many will go above the simplicity of what? The work. It's about the work, brothers and sisters. It says many will go above the Simplicity. In other words, the reason why we'll be lost is not because we can't accomplish the work or it's too complicated. Sometimes it's too what? Simple. We go above the simplicity of the work. They will conform to the world, cherish idols, and become spiritually dead. But the humble, self-sacrificing followers of who? I want to follow Jesus. What do you say? Will pass on where? To perfection. That's where we're going to be brought. Leaving behind the indifferent and lovers of the world. Brothers and sisters, we have to say like the songwriter says. He says, look, if all the world forsake thee by thy grace, guess what? I'll follow thee. Now, brothers and sisters, she says a startling fact, but a small portion question. Is 1% a small portion, yes or no? Yes. Let's see what portion she was talking about. What percentage of this small portion she's talking about? The very next paragraph, it says, I was what? To where? Now, if you want to understand the small portion they're going through in the last days, where did God take her back to? Talk to me. Ancient Israel. Now, let's go to ancient Israel for a moment. Now, it says, it says, of that vast army that left Egypt, it says, but how many? Two of the adults of that vast or large army left Egypt entered the land of what? Amen. Now, I want to ask you a question. Because understand that statement when she says a small portion of making it. Then the prophet said, God took her back to ancient Israel and said, if you want to know how much you're going to make it in the church, go back and look at ancient Israel. Of that vast company that left, how many made it in? Two. How many left? I want to know the percentage of that. Do you know how many left Egypt? Go in your Bible to Exodus. What book did I say? Let's go to Exodus chapter 12. Go to Exodus 12. Let's let the Bible tell us. Everything the prophet says, the Bible says. Go to Exodus 12. And notice what the Bible says in Exodus 12. Because everything that prophet says, the Bible says, do you believe that? Well, then you're almost a seven-day Adventist. <laughs> you understand it before it's over. Exodus chapter 12. Notice what the Bible says in Exodus 12. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. The prophet says that a small portion is going to make it in. We're going to find out that's less than 1%. When the prophet said it was a startling, not fiction, but a startling fact, she said what God showed her is if you want to know the small portion, go back to ancient Israel. Look at the percentage. Of that vast army, only two made it in. Well, how many left Egypt? Look at Exodus chapter 12. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Let's read verse 37 together. Exodus 12 and verse 37 all together. What does the Bible say? And the children, I can't hear you. Exodus 12, I can't hear you. Verse 37 says, and the children of Israel journey from where? Ramses to Succoth. About how many? 600,000 on foot that were men beside the children. In other words, how many thousand footmen were, were walking or leaving Egypt? How many? 600,000 footmen. 600,000 foot, footmen. Now, my brothers and sisters, was that everybody that left Egypt? Yes or no? Uh -uh. Did that count the children? Did it count the women? So now, if you add the women, you could probably get close, uh, almost a million. You add the children. Now, you add the children, you're in trouble because those Hebrew women were very fruitful. I mean, they were multiplying. You read the Bible. It said, the, the, the midwife said, if, if ever they came out, they were just pushing those children out. So you know there's over a million, a million plus that left Egypt. But we won't even use a million. Let's, the Bible says that God would err on the side of mercy. So let's just take 600,000, although we know it was much more than that. Let's just take 600,000 and look at that vast army. 
And let's look at how many made it in. How many made it in? Talk to me. Two. Two. Now I want to ask you a question. What is 10% of 600,000? What is 10%? 10% is how much? I was about to say, now you're doing time, aren't you? <laughs> and 10%, you know time. Someone said, well, I'm not making 600,000. Well, it's okay, okay. So 600,000, that's 60,000. Did 60,000 make it in? What is 1% of 600,000? 6,000. 6, Did 6,000 make it in? All right. What is 0.01% of 600,000? Now, I want to ask you a question. Somebody said, but that was ancient Israel. But question, what about today? Does what happened in ancient Israel have anything to do with today? Yes or no? Yes. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10. And notice what the Bible says. We're going to see that everything that happened to ancient Israel has an effect upon us in these last days. 1 Corinthians 10, beginning in verse 11. Let's read that together. 1 Corinthians 10. Notice what the Bible says. Now, 1 Corinthians 10 is talking about the children of Israel. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1. The Bible says, moreover, brethren, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Verse 2, and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Talking about the children of Israel when they left Egypt, 1 Corinthians 10. Now, notice what the Bible says about them in verse 6. Let's read verse 6 together. What does it say? Now, these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after what? As they also lusted. But now notice verse 11. Talking about the children of Israel. Their wanderings through the wilderness. Verse 11 says, Now all these things, how many things? How much? All these things happen unto them. Look what the Bible says. How? For what? Now you know what that word in sample means? That word in samples comes from the Greek word typos. It means type, shadow, example. Antitype is a type. So it says, all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written not for them. They are written for what? Talk to me, somebody. Our admonition. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. So the Bible is telling us that what happened to ancient Israel is not for ancient Israel. It's written as a warning for us upon the end of the world. Now, are we at the beginning of the end? Yes or no? We're reaching it. So my brothers and sisters, this is for us. And the Bible is telling us that less than 1% of that group went in. It says their dead bodies were strewn in the wilderness because of their what? Transgressions. Mard and Israel are in not the same danger, but what? Greater danger of forgetting God and being led into idolatry than were his ancient people. Many idols are worshipped even by profess what? Even by us. Now, my brothers and sisters, you look at Gideon's army. Started with 32,000. How many actually were used by God to defeat the enemy in Gideon's day? Not 32,000. You remember they were tested first. You remember they had a few tests. And as they were tested, the first call, the first test went out. And guess what took place? 10,000. Immediately, as it were, almost overnight, something happened to them. You remember Gideon's army? 32 that? 10% is what? 3,200. Uh, 3, Did 3,200 finish in that army that Gideon used? Yes or no? How many was in that little band in Judges 7 that God used to win that war? How many was in that great army? 300. Now, brothers and sisters, do you know that 1% of 32,000 is what? 320. So that means that 300 is less than what? You don't have a place in the Bible. Well, more than 1%. And all this was written for us upon whom the ends of the world is coming. Brothers and sisters, and do you know they were tested? The first test, 22,000 left. Now, my brothers and sisters, but then there was a final test. And you know what they were told during that final test? It was mixed upon the point of appetite. They were told to go down. And as they were given down to drink or to, to, to partake of that, of, of, of that temporal water, some people got down and lapped like, uh, like a dog. <laughs> Jumped into the water. Put the water over their heads. Some other people, they were heavenly seals. They weren't navy seals, they were heavenly seals. And they're going down and they're drinking. They're looking. 
One eye looking up because they had to take care of their temporal duties, but the other eye was saying, we better get ready because we're in the war. Do you know that brothers and sisters, those were the men that were tested in such little ways character is displayed. The final test, if man cannot overcome appetite, he will never get the victory over every other sin. And my brothers and sisters, we are slaves to appetite. And the Bible says that him that strive for the mastery, he must be what? Temperate in all things. Now, my brothers and sisters, you see that no matter what, that this tells me what is the lesson that God is trying to teach us. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Look at the lesson. The Bible says in verse 12, let's read it together. It says, wherefore, let him that, what's the next word, thinketh he what? Standeth. See, the whole issue is to prepare somebody that can stand. Then it says, let him that thinketh he standeth do what? Take heed lest what? Now, brothers and sisters, that comes to me. You know, it's not enough to preach about this. You can preach other than yourself be a what? Castaway. That comes to you. As you're sitting in these seats, oh, I'm a, I go to the Pillars of Faith Church. Oh, I, I go to this church. Oh, I go to this place. Oh, I study. I'm a minister. I'm an evangelist. I'm a pastor. I'm a teacher. I'm a missionary. I'm a seven-day Adventist. You better take heed lest we what? Do you know, brothers and sisters, again and again, do you know that normally when God does something, that the ark was prepared, but there was more room to save people than people who actually got on board the ark? Do you know in these meetings, there are more visitors than the actual members of the church? And this should tell us that guess what? If we will not fill these places, God will bring others to do it if we will not do it. God's not dependent upon us. He's not dependent on uh, the weak, uh, fig, uh, uh, fickle mortals. God is going to take somebody who is serious and he's going to do it. I'm going to tell you something. I don't know about everybody else, but as for me and my house, we're going to be a part of this team. What about you? But in order to be a part of that team, it's going to take a great work. And it's going to be done, not in a long time, a great work in a what? Short time. Now, do you remember that there were many things in the sanctuary to study, but there were two things that were essential. Remember that? Yes. We saw them in the life of Christ. What book in the Bible did we go to again and again to try to help us to fix our minds on that which was essential in the plan of redemption that we saw in the life and ministry of Jesus? What text in the Bible? John. John. Let's go there again. Go to John chapter 9. I told you there's a lot in this text. Go to John chapter 9. Let's look at it again. John chapter 9. We found out many things in the sanctuary interesting that we can study, but there are two things that are essential. What's the first? Talk to me. What's the first? Come on. No, 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 no. Come on. Talk to me. In the sanctuary, two things. We saw it in the life and ministry of Christ. Now, you, I know you did your review last night. Amen. Amen. In John 9, it told us two things. Amen. Work. And what? Time. time. You don't remember that? Working time. Great work, what? Little time. Great work, short time. Great work, little time. Those are the same two things Jesus was looking at. And you know you're on the safe grounds when you do what Jesus did. Remnant of the seed should be doing what the seed did. Now in John 9, notice that. John 9, verse 4. Please remember this. John 9, verse 4. This is important. John 9, verse 4. Let's read that together. What does the Bible say? It says, I must what? Work the works of him that sent me. So the first thing Jesus was talking about was what? Work. It says, I must work the works of him that sent me because I have forever to do this work. Is that what he says? He says, when? While it is what? What does he mean by day? What is he talking about by day? He's talking about what? Time. While it is day. What for, Jesus? He says, why? He says, the night cometh when what? So there's going to come a time when no longer can Jesus work for the redemption of his people. What do we call that when Jesus can no longer work for redemption? What do we call that? The close of probation. Did the Jewish nation have probation? Yes or no? So my brothers and sisters, Jesus understood this. Now, that means that in the remnant church, in the sanctuary, there are two great things that we must understand. What two great things must we understand as we look at the sanctuary? We must understand the work of the sanctuary and we must understand the time of the sanctuary. We studied this. In fact, early writing 64 says time is almost finished. It says, I saw that there was a what? Great work to do for them and but what? Little time in which you do it. Same two things. We see in the Bible, we see in the spirit of prophecy. Early writing 64. So we saw two things. First, time of redemption or the sanctuary. Second, work of redemption or the sanctuary. Now, my brothers and sisters, as we studied the night before, we found out the time of redemption or the time in the sanctuary. What is the entire time allotted to the sanctuary? Talk to me. 7,000 years. Do we prove it from the Bible? Yes. Do we prove it from the spirit of prophecy? Yes. 
And my brothers and sisters, this is so. Now, we showed you that every seven Adventists used to believe this. We went through and showed the pioneers how they said the same thing. We talked about the fact that the songs were even sung, but we forgot it because we developed spiritual. We've lost our distinctive identity. But where is the place to go to get this understanding back? Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I therein. Now, my brothers and sisters, that was the time. Was it all in one block time? Was it broke up into two ratios? What was the ratio? Six and one. For God, how much? 6,000 years on earth. He's going to do a work. And then 1,000 years in heaven. And then the work is finished. And 6,000 plus 1,000 equals God finishes everything in sevens. Now, my brothers and sisters, but we said, we studied that. And we'll come back to that tonight, too, because we're going to come back and see. We start showed how close we were. Now, last night, those who were here, are we close to that? Yes or no? Yes. Are we in that generation? Did we prove that last night? Yes. Now, my brothers and sisters, we'll come back to that before we close. But we said we spent time with the time, but we did not have spent enough time with the work of redemption. With the what? Work. We got to understand better what the work of redemption is. There's a great work that has to be done. Now, of the two, work and time, which one is more important? Work. work. The whole purpose of time is work. There's a time to everything, every work under heaven. There's a work that has to be done. And if the work is not done on time, then Jesus would never be able to finish and complete the plan of redemption. And if he doesn't redeem us, we're lost. This is the issue. Now, my brothers and sisters, we begin to study this. We found out that there is a work that the sanctuary has to do. Look what it says here. It says, I also saw that many do not, what's that next word? Realize not what they should teach, but what they must be in order not to die, but in order to what? live in the sight of the Lord without a what? Do you know if everybody died, the plan of redemption cannot be finished. Do you know that somebody has to live? There has to be a living generation. Somebody has to be able to live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator to vindicate God's character. This is our message. Now, my brothers and sisters, it says to live in the sight of the Lord, the high priest, in the sanctuary, through the time of trouble, now, what must they be? Those who receive the what? So those who do that will receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble. They must reflect the image of Jesus, not a little bit, but how? Fully. In fact, go to 1 Peter. What book did I say? Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and let's see what Jesus looked like because they had to reflect the image of Jesus. How? Fully. Now, let's go back, and you're going to 1 Peter 2, but let me ask you a question about this quotation, a very deep quotation. The first time you read it, you don't see all that's in it. Let's look at it again. It says, I also saw that not many, in fact, we're going to find out that over 90% of the church, seven Adventists, don't understand what we must be in order to what? Amen. Live. Not die, but live. In the sight of the Lord, how? Amen. Without a high priest. How much, what must we be? Think about this for a moment now. Today, if you sin today and you're saved, it's because, guess what's in the sanctuary? A priest. You see, if you sin, the wages of sin is what? Death. Then we all deserve to die because all have sinned. We all deserve to die. But because of a priest, he's made it possible that if you come to him, he's our propitiation. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to do what? Forgive us our sins and to do what? Cleanse us from how much? All unrighteousness. Now, do you know that there's no magic wand? When you say, Lord, forgive me my sins, there's no magic wand. It's just forgiving your sin. That's not what it is. There's a priest that is forgiving your sins, sprinkling his blood. There's a priest up there. So if we sin today, confess our sins tonight, and are saved in the morning, it's because there is a priest in the sanctuary. Question. Tomorrow. If we sin tomorrow, what do we need in the sanctuary? If we're going to be saved. If we sin next week, what do we need in the sanctuary if we're going to be saved? So my brothers and sisters, if we continue to sin and be saved, what do we need to remain in the sanctuary? A priest. But if Jesus remains a priest, how can he come out of the sanctuary at the end of the day of atonement on time? And so the devil's plan is to keep Jesus in the sanctuary until the 6,000 year runs out. And the only thing he has to do is get you to sin and me to sin. He can keep Jesus tied up inside the sanctuary. At least that's what he thinks. But God has a plan. 
Now, my brothers and sisters, this is the real issue, and no other denomination even have the ability to understand it. Sincere Christians in every church, but only us have this understanding from the Bible. Then, my brothers and sisters, they did not end at the cross. It's going on right now. Everything is still at stake. Now, that means that in order to live during this time, we have to live without what? So that Jesus Michael can stand up and finish his work and then crush the head of the serpent. Now, my brothers and sisters, that's why it says those who receive the seal of the living God, those are those who stand and are protected in the time of trouble, must reflect the image of Jesus. How? Fully. Now, in other words, what does Jesus look like? Because Jesus, could he live when there's no priest? Yes or no? The way Jesus lived on earth, he could live without a priest. In fact, who was the priest for Christ? Do you know that if Jesus had sinned, there was no priest? If Jesus sinned, it's over. You know, there used to be, a, a, you, know, you know how you have these uh, little circuses that come to town. Barnum and Bailey. I know you're not going to circuses, but Barnum and Bailey, they come into town and they have all these different types of circuses. But you know, they used to have the ones called, those these men that they, they fly on these called the flying trapeze. You, you ever seen the men? They jump and they jump on the other and they grab hold and then they throw the person over and then they go in that little at the point and they swing back and forth. You know, what, and these different circuses, when they're supposed to be professionals, in practice, they fly those things way up in the air. Sometimes 50 feet, 100 feet in the air. They're flying through and you, people, whoa, whoa. In practice, guess what they have? A net. What for? If they fall. It catches them and they bounce over. Everything's all right. But on showtime night, guess what happens to the net? No net. If they fall then, guess what? That's their life. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that from the beginning of time, there's been a net. But when there's no priest, guess what? No net. And so God had to bring us to this place. Jesus is the only person in the earth who ever lived without a priest or a net. There was no mediator, Isaiah said, and his arm brought salvation. I say that man's beautiful. What do you say? And Jesus is offered to give his life, his perfect life to us if we embrace it. I want Jesus. But brothers and sisters, not only is he going to put that life on our record, put that life on our life, he's going to put his life and make it a part of us. This is the difference between imputed righteousness and imparted righteousness. You ever heard of that? And righteousness by faith, there are two parts. One is the work of the holy place. The other is the work of the most holy place. Imputed righteousness, never forget it. You study it through the Bible. It simply means that God put something to you. But you didn't do. Imparted righteousness doesn't mean that it's just put to you. It means that it becomes a what? Part of you. And so my brothers and sisters, it's not enough for him to just change your record. He must make his life a part of your life. I want Jesus. What do you say? Now, my brothers and sisters, let's see what Jesus looks like. Let's look at his life. First Peter 2. And when you get there, let me know by saying Amen. 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 21. Let's read that together. 1 Peter 2 and verse 21. What does the Bible say? It says, For even hereunto were ye what? Call. Because Christ, that's the man, Jesus Christ. He also did what? Suffer for us. Now, I don't know about you, but to take me, a sinner, make me like Christ, a Savior, that's a great work. Is that a great work for you? Now, notice what it says he looked like. Watch now. It says in 1 Peter 2, verse 21, it says... For even to hear where we call, because Christ also suffered for us. Let's read that together. Leaving us a what? Amen. Question. What is an example? Is something just to look at and just say, oh, that's wonderful? It's a pattern. It's a motto. It's something to color, copy, imitate, or to follow. So let's see that. The Bible says it. In verse 21, it goes on to say, leaving us an example that ye should what? Follow his steps. Talking about the steps of Christ. Steps to Christ. Now, notice now that the steps of Christ, he has some big shoes to fill. Look at verse 22. Who did no sin, neither was gal found in his what? Mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. In other words, no matter how much people threatened him and talked about him, they could call him all types of names. Fanatic, extremist, legalist, time setter. He didn't fight back. He was so loving that he said, you can call me what you want. Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You know, we have to be that way no matter what happens to us, no matter what anyone does to us, we have to be just like Jesus. Do you know that we can't do that without God? We need Jesus. But now, all I want to do is look at the first step of Christ. 
Just the first step. Go back to verse 22 and tell me the first four words talking about what Jesus looked like that we're supposed to follow. What's the first four words of verse 22 all together? Who did what? Who did what? I'm putting that on the board. Who did? No sin. Now, this is Jesus. But those who receive the seal must look what? Just like Jesus. Well, what does Jesus look like? Is that a good question? How does Jesus look? Jesus did what? So then what must happen to the sinner to make him look just like the Savior? Then the sinner must be brought back to the place where he too will what? Do no sin. How much is no? How much of sin is that uh, le left out? So then he becomes, he is to become what? Sin, not foe, but what? Sinless. Now my brothers and sisters, do you know that Jesus was a sinless spotless lamb of God and Jesus the work of the sanctuary is for Jesus to take a sinner who is polluted and restore in him the image of his maker so that once again the sinner looks just like the Savior that's the plan of redemption someone says that's impossible well that's impossible you might as well give up on the great controversy this is the issue now my brothers and sisters, someone says, well, well, how can we stop sinning? Well, that just tells me we don't understand the work of the sanctuary and we need to spend some time looking at the work of the sanctuary. Now you remember yesterday, we were talking about this work. We found out that God's purpose is to prepare people to stand and we saw that God gave us how he's going to bring us back to this place under the symbol of a what? Lamb. And under the symbol of a what? Who does the lamb represent? Who does the priest represent? Is that in the Bible? We studied this yesterday. Who is the lamb? Give me a text. John 1, 29. That's Jesus. Who is the priest? Give me a text. Hebrews 4, what? 14. Good. We studied this. Now, this is the three places of the sanctuary. Now, why are there only two symbols or two work to be done if there are three places? Why? Because the work of the outer court is the work of the lamb. lamb. The work of the holy place is the work of the the work of the most holy place is the work of the priest. But the priest starts his work in the holy place, but finishes the work in the most holy. Now, in the holy place, he puts his life to our record. In the most holy place, he makes his life a part of our life. And so the two sanctuaries, the two parts, puts us in purity and imparted righteousness before the work is done. Now, my brothers and sisters, you've got to understand something. When Jesus does this, you have to understand that Jesus does both of these things. Do you know that we can't make ourselves sinless? We cannot make ourselves sinless. The Bible says with men, this is what? Impossible. But with God, how much? All things are possible. Now, what does it take in order to become sinless? What does it take in order to become sinless? What does it take in order to become sinless? We will see it takes three things. How many things? Three. I can't hear you. How many things? Three. Now, it's one thing, but it has to happen on three levels. Now, in biblical perfection, very simple. When God made man, what was man? Perfect. How do we know? Because God was, man was made in the image of? And God is perfect. Am I right? So when God made him in his own image, Genesis 1, 26, 27, man was perfect. What messed up that perfection? What marred the perfection? Sin. So then in order to get back to biblical perfection, what has to happen to sin? It has to be what? The only thing that messed up the perfection, sin, it has to be removed. So the Bible says, behold the Lamb of God that does what? take away the sin of the world to bring us back to sinless perfection. So to be brought back to sinless perfection, three things must take place. Number one, sin must be taken from the books of record. It must be taken from where? Is there a book of record? Yes or no? Everything we do, an angel writes it down. Even if you snuck in the darkest night, do you know that every sin we've ever committed has been recorded by an angel? This is why you can't fool God. A child can pretend and fool his parents. A parent can pretend around their child. Brother can, can pretend around sister, husband against wife, but you cannot fool God. God sees every sin. And everyone is written now, not so that we can be lost. He wants to save us, but he has to record the sins. And he keeps accurate account. Now, my brothers and sisters, in order to become sinless, sin must be removed from the books of record. But not only must sin be removed from the books of record, but sin must be removed from the heart of the believer. From the what? Do you know that everything that we do 
is not only written down in heaven, but you know the Bible teaches us that sins are actually written in our DNA or in our hearts when we commit it. And my brothers and sisters, in order for Jesus to bring us back to sinlessness, the priest, he must write his law in the mind and in the heart. Now, my brothers and sisters, not only that, because someone says, well, I thought it was enough to cleanse the sanctuary just by removing the sins from the books. But no, that's not enough. You know, all the book of record is, is a record. It's like a thermometer. Now, right now, it's out, you go outside, it's cold outside. And some of you, the devil thought he can just stop you from coming by making it cold, but you showed he was a liar. Amen? You can't. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. It's cold outside. You don't want it to be cold. You take out your thermometer and you read the reading. 32 degrees. You say, whoa, 32 degrees. Now, I want to ask you a question. You see the mercury in it. You take the thermometer and you break it. The mercury comes out. The record of the temperature broken, gone. And all of a sudden, the mercury goes down and it raises back up. 85 degrees. Did it change the temperature? The mere changing of a record does not change someone in reality. Let me say it again another way. Let me come a little closer. You know, I remember when we used to go to school. I don't know if they do it nowadays, but they used to give report cards. Then they give progress reports before the card came. And you, I used to always hate that. I, I, I was so bad, I failed handwriting when they, as an elementary. I mean, it's terrible. But I want to ask you a question. I remember seeing some uh, men, young brothers, they would take the report card home and they had a way of changing things around. <laughs> they got F's, all F's. And they going home, they said, I'm going to fix that. I'm, I'm not worried about that. And they gave it to their parents and they said, they smiling, look, I was good. Then they get a report card up. And parent, look, and they see a funny looking A. <laughs> Some say, A, you know how, you know, you just F, you just put the line down, look like an A. <laughs> And some parents dumb enough, yo, oh, man, you're so intelligent. Yeah, go play video games. That's how dumb we are sometimes. But some parents are no more intelligent than that. And they say, now, nah, that's a funny looking F. But listen, the mere changing of the record of that report card, is that going to make the student more intelligent? Is that going to make him smarter? Is that going to change his heart and life? So my brothers and sisters, if God were just to blot out sins and cleanse the sanctuary of the record of sins, would that solve the problem on the earth? So in order to bring us back to perfection, he must not only take sin from the record, from the books of record, but the cleansing of the sanctuary means that there must be a special work of purification on the earth. He must remove sin from the heart of the believer. He must remove sin not only from the heart inside, but he must remove it also from the life, the everyday life of the believer. Because brothers and sisters, what we live demonstrates what's inside. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Keep thy heart, Proverbs 4.23 says, with all diligence. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Whatever's in the heart is demonstrated in the life. So in order to be brought back to perfection, sin must be removed from three places. How many places? What are the three places? Sin must be taken from the books of record. Sin must be taken from the heart of the believer, and sin must be taken from the life of the believer. And if we're still sinning, are we sinless? If sin is still in our heart, are we sinless? If sin is still in the book of records, are we sinless? And so my brothers and sisters, this is the work of the sanctuary. Can Jesus do it? Yes or no? And he shows us this work as a lamb and a priest. Question, what does he do as a lamb to take away our sins? Can he just come and take away our sins? Yes or no? What's the first work of the pre of the lamb that we showed you, or the first work of redemption symbolized by the lamb we showed you last night? That the lamb was what? That's where we were what? Bought. And the priest, what does he do? Talk to me. It, the priest not only bought us, but then the priest does what? Brought us. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. Which one comes first? To be brought, well, now, question, where does God want to bring us? Bring us where? In the most holy place where? It says to restore man the image of his maker. To what? Bring him back to what? Perfection. So where is the priest going to bring us in the most holy place? He's going to bring us back to perfection. So my brothers and sisters, what comes first? To be brought back to sinless perfection or to be bought by the lamb? Which one comes first? Do you know it has to be that way? It's practical. Let me explain it this way. I'm in Atlanta. Now I wouldn't never do this. I wouldn't want to live in Atlanta. I wouldn't never. I can't wait to get out of it to tell you the truth. <laughs> I'm praying, Lord, hold up the crisis until I get home. Yes, oh yes. 
I would not want to be in a city when a crisis breaks. I'm going to tell you, in Atlanta, it's terrible. It's going to be, do you understand? There's not enough food. Do you know in just three days, all the food in the city is going to be gone? And we're going to show you in a few days. We're going to show you that that's getting ready to happen now. God told us, get out of the cities and to retire country places, and we are playing games. Oh, it's not salvific. You're out of your mind. You've lost your mind. I'm going to show you from the Bible. You've lost your mind. You see, my brothers and sisters, we must do whatever it takes to put us in a position where we can develop a relationship with what? Jesus Christ. This is the issue. This is the issue. We've got to get to know God. And whatever it takes, I don't know about you, I don't want to make it harder. I want to make it easier. Now, my brothers and sisters, you've got to understand something. If you look and start seeing everything that is happening in Atlanta and the cities. So I wouldn't want to live here, but I'm just giving you an example. A person is in the city, he's walking by, he sees a house. He looks at the house, and the house says, $1,000 for sale. Man, it has a, it's on a corner lot, big there, the, it has two floors. He says, man, the windows are messed up, but other than that, the house could be fixed up easily. And they're selling it for $1,000. He says, you know what? I'm going to buy that home and then I'm going to flip it or, or sell it. Excuse me. I'm going to sell it. And then, and then after I sell it, <laughs> then after I sell it, then I'm going to, uh, after I sell it, then I'm going to go to the country. Amen. I give you a good idea. Amen. <laughs> that's what he says. So the man said, I'm going to do that. And so all of a sudden, every night after work, he goes to that house and starts fixing it up. Gets the paint. Now, he saw the sign and said, you know, no trespassing. But he said, don't worry about it. I'm going to buy it. And so he climbs over the fence. He gets into it. He starts painting everything, fixing the holes up, doing electrical work, fixing everything up. And all of a sudden, woo, woo, woo. And the man comes out. Officer? He says, can I help you? Officer, officer, I'm just fixing up the house. Uh, is this your house? Uh, well, no, but I am getting ready to buy it. He said, you may, uh, what do he say, you may, <laughs> he said, brother, come with me. <laughs> hey, look, come with me. He said, but, but I'm going to buy it. He don't want to hear that. He's going to cuff you. You have the right to remain silent. That's what he'll tell you. Now, my brother and sisters, why would he do that? Because you don't have the right to fix something up until it's yours. So Jesus, the first part of redemption, he went to the cross of Calvary and bought humanity so that Christ has the right to fix us up. And when the devil comes to Jesus and says, sir, what are you doing? He says, sold, this is mine. Amen. And he can restore us. Amen. It's almost like, you know, my teacher used to tell me about, and I remember I used to see something called the $60 million man. Y'all may not know about that, but there's this man, he was, he was messed up in an accident. He couldn't, he was almost dead. Put him on a table. And while he's on this table, they're working on him. And they said, look, he's almost dead, but we can rebuild him. Stronger than he was. Faster than he was. He could, he could, man could have bionic eyes. He could see far. Bionic uh, arms, leg could jump up high, strong. Well, Jesus, when we went into sin, it looked like we were lost. And God said to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, we can rebuild him. Yes. I don't care how much sin he's done. The beauty of the plan reveals the beauty of the man. All we got to do is put ourselves on that table. Amen. That table is the table of the altar of sacrifice. We say, dear God, I present my body a living sacrifice. Whatever I must give up so that you can work on me, I give it up so that you can come into my heart and change me so that I can look just like Jesus. Now, my brothers and sisters, what I want to show you is that the book of Peter shows the entire story. We saw in Leviticus in the Old Testament. We're going to show you the New Testament says the same thing because the burden of every book, every passage is the unfolding of the plan of what? Now notice what the plan is. God is going to bring us back to perfection. What does perfection look like? Remember, it says to be redeemed means to what? Cease from sin. Now I'm going to show you that's exactly from the Bible. Everything that prophet says, the Bible says. Now look at Peter. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Now remember the story. The story is that Jesus in the work of redemption first, he has to buy us, pay the price. Then once he bought us, he can begin to work to bring us back. He puts his perfect life to our charge. Then he takes sin out of the heart. Then he puts his life in our life, and we can come back to the place where we look just like Jesus, and no longer do we sin. Let's show you that from the book of Peter. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 18. Let's read that together. Now the burden of this passage, plan of redemption. Look at verse 18 all together. You're there, amen? 
Let's read that together. What does the Bible say? It says, for as much as ye know that you are not redeemed with what? As silver and gold from your vain conversation. In other words, you couldn't be bought with money. Receive my tradition from your fathers. Verse 19. But with the, talk to me somebody. With the precious blood of what? Christ. As of a lamb. How? Without blemish and what? Oh, he's beautiful. Thou art fair. Beautiful, my love. There is no spot in thee. What makes him beautiful is the spotless lamb of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb. What was the work of the lamb? Pay the price so that man could be bought. That's 1 Peter chapter 1. What's the second part of redemption? Not only that man must be bought, but that he must be what? Brought. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. What book did I say? 1 Peter. What chapter? Chapter 1. 3. Chapter 1, man was bought by the precious blood of the Lamb. Chapter 3, man must be brought by the priests. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. Let's read that together. 1 Peter 3 verse 18. What does the Bible say? For Christ also have one suffered how? For sins. The just for what? What for? That he might, what's the next word? Bring us to God. So in 1 Peter 1, he's bought by the Lamb. 1 Peter 3, he's brought to God. What separates us from God? Talk to me. Sin. So he has to bring us out of sin. He has to bring us back to perfection. Now, what does that look like? Where is he bringing us to? Chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. In chapter 1, he's bought by the Lamb, the blood. Chapter 3, he's brought back to perfection. Chapter 4, it tells us what we will look like. 1 Peter chapter 4. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 1 Peter 4 verse 1. Let's read that together. What does the Bible say? For as much then as Christ has suffered for us, where? In the flesh. Arm yourselves likewise with what? The same mind. For he that hath what? In other words, we have to have this mind of Christ. He that has suffered in the flesh hath, what's the last three words? He has what? What does cease mean? Now, twice, what does the prophet say? To be redeemed means to what? The exact words. Chapter, everything the prophet says, the Bible says. 1 Peter 1, brought. 1 Peter 3, brought. 1 Peter 4, brought to a place where the mind of Christ and his law is in it. No longer do we sin. And then the Bible says, how long will we not sin? Verse 2. Verse 2 says, that he, what's the next two words? No longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men. But what? How long can he stay in that position with the mind of Christ for the rest of his life? That is the plan of redemption. Now, my brothers and sisters, we found out that if God could not bring man back to that place, what would happen? Remember that? What would happen? If God could not bring man back to a sinless condition, what would happen? The whole plan would be forfeited. Satan's head could not be what? Because remember, God declares the end when? From the beginning. So at the very beginning of time, beginning of time, he told us what was going to happen at the end of time. Go to Leviticus 16. What book did I say? Go back to Leviticus 16. What day is Leviticus 16 telling us about? What day? The tenth day of the seventh month. What is it called? The day of atonement. Now, my brothers and sisters, you remember, we found out that this is the condition that God wants to bring us back to. We found out that if God could not bring us back to perfection, it says, if Christ could be overcome, the earth would become what? Satan's kingdom. And the human race would be forever in his power. With the issues of the conflict before him, Jesus understood what was at stake. We found out that everything was at stake, and Satan is flattering himself that he will still obtain the victory. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is what Satan is trying to stop. He does not want his head to be what? Crushed. Is his head going to be crushed, yes or no? Yes. It's going to be crushed. What is Jesus, the priest, going to use to crush the head? What is he going to use to crush the head? Talk to me. Yes. Now, it started at the cross, but we found out last night that it's going to be finished on the day of atonement. At that time, the priest is going to do what? He's going to come out of the sanctuary and transfer the sin that he got from the records, from the heart and from the life. And he's going to put it where? Where is he going to put it? On the head of the scapegoat. What crushes Satan's head is not the hand of the priest. What crushes Satan's head is the sin. 
Well, where did the priest get the sin from? Jesus. Was Jesus sinning up in heaven? No. Where did Jesus get the sin from? They're going to crush on Satan's head. From the sanctuary. And to 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be? Yes. Well, where did the sanctuary get the sin from? Where did the books of record get it from? The books of record don't sin by themselves. Where did they get it from? Yes. From the hearts of the believers. They got it from the life of the believer. So my brothers and sisters, where must Jesus take the sin that he's going to use to crush the head of Satan? From our hearts and lives. So what if we hold on to sin? What will Jesus be able to use to crush Satan's head? Then Satan would never die. And Jesus would win the great controversy. Nobody understands this. Everything is at stake. My brother and sisters, we've got to get victory over sin through the power of the indwelling Christ. What do you say? Amen. God is going to get somebody. Now, everybody's not going to do it. And Jesus is going to say, either you're going to have to be cleaned up or you're going to have to be cleaned out of the church. Because he's going to use it. He's going to take everybody in the congregation's sins or he's going to separate you from the congregation. See, if you will not give up sin, then he must give you up. Jesus wants to destroy sin. Hell fire is not for the sinner. Hell fire is to destroy sin. But if we hold on to sin, he will destroy us with the sin when all he wants to do is get rid of the sin. But guess what? If we'll give up sin, then Jesus can save us and destroy the sin. I want to give it up. What do you say? Yeah. Now, my brother, I'll never forget. We were, doing, we were out in the country living in our home. And it was the first little place we used to live before God moved us on to another place in the country, uh, up into the hills. But when we were there, I remember it was one of the first times I put out my garden. And I'm like a little child when I put that garden out. I like to see it grow. I put the garden out. I got the whole ground. Man, brother, I was double digging, getting that ground just right. And when I first got there, you can barely put a shovel in the ground. I jump on the shovel. It flipped me over. I said, man, I'm breaking up the ground. And finally, we got it to a place where you could just put, I could take a little uh, a garden fork and drop it. And it go in the ground. I said, praise the Lord. And that's, that's hard work. But now, my brothers and sisters, I remember one day, I, we just finished doing all that. I planted a nice garden, took care of that thing. A day later, I'm out the window looking. Is it growing yet? Now, I know it takes seven days at least for the seed to sprout, but I want to see it. So every day, I'm coming out about, uh, about 11 o'clock. I pass by the window, and I'm looking. <laughs> Five minutes later, I'm looking. And one day, as I looked out, there was a serpent, snake. See, we're in the country. You see them all the time. <laughs> and I saw that. I saw that snake. And as I saw the snake, I said, oh, he and my God, I got to get him. And look, someone said, well, what type of snake was he? Was he a, a killer snake? Or you got to just, look, only a good snake is a dead snake. <laughs> and so I went outside. Yes, that's true. <laughs> so I went outside and I got my shovel. Uh, Gardner's country man, best friend. I took my shovel. We had a several of them out there. I took one and I went outside and it had just started raining so the ground was soft. And so I took my shovel and I went to the, where the serpent was and I came down on the, on the snake. And boom. But remember now, I had been working the ground. If it was like it was before, it would have killed him. But it was the ground was so soft. I stopped him, but he was there. And the more I pushed down, it kept going into the ground. And every time I pushed down a little bit more, the snake came out just a little bit more from my a shovel. Getting a little bit longer and longer as it's coming toward me. I, I'm thinking, I, I stopped pushing. Because I, I keep pushing. He's going to go in the mud, come out, and he got me, you know. <laughs> so I kept my stuff right there. And I'm thinking, I, I'm pondering to myself, now what am I going to do? I know what I need. There's another shovel I had on the side. I need that shovel, but I can't let him go. But I praise God, I had a wife. <laughs> it's good when you have a wife. Amen. Uh, such a wife. And she wasn't a city girl. She's a country girl. Yes. You better have a country girl. And so I said, Honey! That's what I said, you know, honey! And, they said, and she came running out of the house just like that. Boom, she came out and she saw me. It just took her a moment as a country girl to find out what was going on. And she sized up and saw the snake. And I said, honey, my shovel. She grabbed my shovel. Now imagine if she took that shovel and she said, oh, <laughs> you want this shovel? <laughs> shovel! <laughs> she didn't do that though, praise the Lord. She brought me the shovel. I quickly got the shovel. I put one shovel on the ground to become like the ground. I took the other shovel. Boom. Came on his pallet, his head. Boom. Crushed it. Cut it off. Then I took a, my cell phone out and took a picture of him. <laughs> I said, remember this. <laughs> he going to see it again. Now, my brothers and sisters, while we may smile at that, the Lord showed me an object lesson. You see, God in the country teaches you. And as I was out there, he said that I, the husband, represented Christ. That serpent represented Satan. That, 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 that woman, my wife, represented the church. 
And that, that shovel that is used to kill the serpent is sin. And what's happening is Jesus cannot finish the work. He at the cross stopped the snake, but he cannot finish the work unless the church gives him not the shovel, but our sins. And you know what we're doing? Five, four, few months left and few years left, we'll say, oh, Jesus, you want my sin? Here it is. Oh. And we're playing with sin, watching it on television, eating it, playing with it, looking at it, loving it. How in the world, if we love Jesus, can we hold on to sin? My brother and sister, I don't care where it is in my life. I want to give it to him and give it to him now. My brothers and sisters, because when we give it to Jesus, he can take the sin and do what? Crush the head of the serpent. And then Eden lost can become Eden what? Restored. But my brothers and sisters, this has to happen on what? Time. Now, you remember now, this is the sinner's condition. It says, everyone who by faith obeys God's commandments will reach the condition of what? Sinlessness. Now, how much of the sin does the priest take of the congregation? What does it say in verse 20? All their iniquities, how much? All their transgression and how much? All their sins. Look at Leviticus 16, verse 21. It says, And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, all their transgression, and how much? All their sins, putting them on the head of the goat and shall send them away by the hand of a fit man. Now, my brothers and sisters, how much iniquity? Oh. How much transgression? Oh. How much sin? So how much is the congregation left with? So then the congregation at the end of the Day of Atonement must be a sinless congregation to finish the work, crush Satan's head. Now, my brothers and sisters, inspiration tells us, though, it's going to be done by the hand of a what? Fit man. Which means if it's going to be done by the hand of a fit man, it means that it has to happen where? What does fit man mean? Timely. Then it has to happen on? What is the time? Talk to me. We studied it. What is the time? 6,000 years. Remember what we read? Remember what we read? Look at this now. I'm going to come back here. It says, a noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. For how long? 6,000 years. The great controversy has been in progress. The Son of God and heavenly messengers have been in conflict with the power of the evil one to warn, enlighten, and save the children of men. Now, how much? All. All have made the decision. It says now. When is now? At the end of what? The wicked have how much? Fully united with Satan. When? At the end of what? Then it says, the time has come. When? At the end of what? So that tells me at the end of 6,000 years, the time has come for what? Please tell me. We studied this. You should understand it now. The time has come for what in the Day of Atonement in the sanctuary? The time has come for what at the end of 6,000 years? Talk to me. It's time for Jesus to do what? Leave the most holy place. With the sin from the records, from the heart, from the life of his people, having a sinless congregation that can live in the sight of holy God without a mediator so he can leave safely. And my brothers and sisters, and then come and put the sin on the head of the scapegoat, and it must happen on time. And we found out last night that in 2019, we are close to the 6,000 years. Did we find out last night? In fact, my brothers and sisters, we found out, let's go a little further, it says, in like manner, the types which relate to the second advent, not might, but must, be fulfilled at the time point on six, uh, symbolic service. We found out that was 6,000. Now, we asked in 2019, how close are we to the end of the 6,000-year limit? How close are we? Now, even when not, now, last night, we actually went through, and we won't do it tonight. We found out the earth, the earth is already over 6,000. Am I right? From 1997, the earth has been over 6,000. We actually went through and started counting from the, the time of the early We counted the time. We found that we actually added it up. And what we found out is that in 2019, it's almost what? Now, we looked more exact yesterday, but we found out that we cannot know the exact year because we don't know the time that sin entered the world, but we can know the generation. Now, my brothers and sisters, we found out that when Jesus came on the earth, he came about how much time of human history had passed off the scene when Jesus came to the earth? About 4,000. Did we read that? Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Where would I go in the Bible to find the birth of Jesus? Where would I go in the Bible to find the birth? Let's go to Luke chapter 2. Let's go to Luke back chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Oh, this is good. Heavenly Father, as we come to the heart of this message tonight, please help us to see this in these last few minutes to understand, Lord, that there's a great work that must happen in a short time. And Father, it includes us. 
We've got to be willing to give you everything. Everything, Lord. Please give us your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you do your homework last night? Did you ask God, Lord, what's in my heart that needs to come out? Okay, that's what we need to give to Jesus. Some people have to go back and say, Lord, there's some videos that I should be giving up. Music I shouldn't be listening to. That I need to be thrown away. Things in my, in my collection that I watch with DVDs and on Netflix and all this other foolishness. There are things in, 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 that we're using in our time and money to say, dear God, no more. By your grace, I want my mind to be pure. I want my thoughts like Jesus. I want to live like Christ. Now, my brothers and sisters, notice what the Bible says in Luke chapter 2. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. We found out, brothers and sisters, that it says that, that when Bethlehem came on the scene, it says, let me back that up. It says, it says the story of Bethlehem, let me back that up. It says the story of Bethlehem is a what? Exhaustless thing. But Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. So when Jesus was born, about 4,000 years of human history had passed off the scene. Now, my brothers and sisters, in Luke chapter 2, we see the birth of Jesus. Now, I want to ask you a question. Just before the 4,000 year, not year, but generation, something happened on earth to give us the greatest evidence that it was time for the 4,000 year and the birth of Christ. Something happened on earth. Anybody remember what it was? Look at Luke chapter 2 verse 1. It says, and it came to pass in those days, Luke 2 verse 1, there went out, what's the next word? What's another name for decree? What's another name for decree? Law. Now remember how long did Esther have in her day? Until the, the day of the decree, the law. Now I'm going to ask you a question. What nation of the world passed this law in the time of Christ at the first coming of Christ? What nation? Rome. Rome. Who was Rome at the time of this? Uh, at the time? Was it, a, uh, was it the world's only superpower? Yes or no? Do you know that Rome controlled the world at that time? What Rome was yesterday, what nation of the world will have to be like that today? The United States of what? So just before the 4,000 year period the superpower of the world, Rome passed a decree that made Jesus become or go to the right place at the right time. So that he could be born at the 4,000 years on time. So then, if history will be repeated and there's nothing more than the Son at the first coming of Christ, just before the second coming of Christ and the 6,000 year, something must happen on earth by the strongest nation on the globe who is not Rome now, but the what? United States of America. What must they do? They must pass a what? Same thing. Type will mean any type. So what event on earth is the greatest sign that the 6,000 years is almost here? The greatest sign in the first coming that the 4,000 is almost there? Decree. Greatest thing at the second coming that the 6,000 years is almost here? Decree. So my brothers and sisters, in 2019, if this is true, we should get ready to be able to see there's a decree. Because we only have a few short years left. In fact, we prove we don't have 100 years. We see the, the president. And, um, and the Pope come on the scene. We said great changes will soon take place and the final movements will be what? Is it happening, yes or no? Yes. Inspiration tells us, it says, by the decree, that's that law, enforcing the institution of the papacy, Sunday law, so may this apostasy be a what? Sign to us that the limit of God's forbearance is what? Volume 5, 451. So the same way that decree told us that the 4,000 year limit generation was about to be reached, Jesus would be born in the fullness of time, that the 6,000 years just before it's reached, a decree will be passed on earth by the United States of America showing us that the limit generation is about to be reached and we only have a few short years at most. My question is, are we nearing that time tonight? Yes or no? Yes. Uh, brothers and sisters, watch this. When national sin law passes on earth, something is going on in the heavenly sanctuary and that's the real issue. We don't have 50 years. We look at this. This generation shall not pass. Now, in 2008, something took place. We don't have time to study it tonight. Something took place prophetically that made us know that this generation is not going to pass. In 2011, what happened to the population? It reached what? What's significant about 7 billion? That ever happened before? When's the last time the world reached 7 billion? At the flood. What happened? The world reached its limit. Climate change. And then what happened? The world ended. So God says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, after 2011, then something came on the scene. People are recognizing this. We saw the population. We saw it happening just like that. Something happened in 2012 within the Seventh Adventist Church. Very significant worldwide. I don't have time to tell you today. Then 2013. 
What happened in 2013? Do you know that all of this happened after the population reached 7 billion? It was a reason for this. We can trace it down. Jesus said, this generation, if you see these things, know that this generation should not pass till what? All these things be fulfilled. Now, my brothers and sisters, what happened? In 2013, how did, how did Pope Francis become Pope? Something happened before. It says, a statement rocks Rome, then sends shock waves where? Around the world. What happened? You remember, Benedict the 16 did what? Now, had a pope ever done that before? One time before, 600 years before. It tells us this. He was resigning on February 28th, said, becoming the first pope to do so in what? Now, do you know that the exact day that he uh, resigned was prophetic in its nature? It was showing us something prophetic. Every seven evidence you saw it 600 years before, if you understood, that meant something. Now, my brothers and sisters, when that happened, now, I don't understand the Pope is supposed to be God. I don't understand how God can step down and retire. I don't know how. But that's what happened. Now, the next Pope coming to the scene, Pope Francis, comes on. The man who won over the world in what? Had a Pope ever done this before? But what does Revelation 13, 3 say? I saw one of his heads that was wounded to death. The deadly one will be healed. And what? All the world would. Now, it's not healed yet, but it's almost healed. It says... We have never seen a pope, never seen a pope become so popular in just a couple of minutes. He was on every article, every television. The prophecy was being fulfilled this 2013. Why is it happening now? Because of what? The great clock of time. Because remember now, we're going to find out that unless that decree is passed, Jesus will not be able to finish his work in the most holy place. Why? What does that mean? Now, my brothers and sisters, for the first time, it says the first what? This openly professed Jesuit Pope for the first time is professing. Now, if you ever play cards, you never tip your hand at the beginning of the game. When do you tip or show your hand? When the game is what? The Catholic Church is showing the hand. You know what? The game is over. My brothers and sisters, God is trying to tell us this is the first time we've seen this. We have but a few short months. There's a relationship between the Pope, the deadly wound, the sunny law, and the plan of redemption and the day of atonement. Why is it happening what? Why the first openly professed Jesuit Pope now? Because the time says it must take place. My brother and sister, you better understand something. He became the first Pope to do what? Has the Pope come to America, yes or no? What year did he come to America? Give me a year. He first came to America in 2015. Now, brothers and sisters, someone says, oh, a Pope came to America before. Yes, he has, but a Pope has never come to Congress. Never. What is so, what is so significant about Congress? Talk to me. That's where laws are what? Passed. And for the first time in 2015, every seven minutes should know what it meant because guess what? Just before he came, he came in September, but just before he came in June of 2015, something happened in America that made his coming make sense. We're going to show you this before it's over with. I can't do it tonight. We're going to show you before it's over. And when he came, he's fulfilling the prophecy. Now, my brothers and sisters, why is it happening now? Why is this the first pope to visit Congress? Why now? It's time for a decree. The law must be passed because remember, if the Sunday law passes at 6,000, then Jesus can't come yet because there's some things that have to come, happen at the six. That means the Sunday law must happen before 6,000. And if we're only just a few short months or a few short years away from 6,000, that means the Sunday law must be getting ready to pass any moment now. If we understand what must take place. Now, my brothers and sisters, there's a difference between a what? UFO and IFO. I know sometimes I preach like this. A man come to me, well, I'm a great grandfather now and I used to preach just like you. I thought there was the end of the world. I preach just like you. I said, sir, respectfully, you're not preaching like me. Respectfully. There's a difference between a UFO and an IFO. You know what a UFO is? Unidentified. Yeah, you saw something, but you didn't know what you saw. You know what an IFO is? Identified. Do you know the inspiration said in the last days that we should be able to understand and not guess at anything, that we can know the time, that surely the Lord God will do nothing but reveal his secrets to the servants, the prophets, that Bible says, I tell you before it come to pass, so that when it come to pass, you might believe. Revelation tells us that when you see these things, don't guess, know that this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth may pass, but not my words. There's a difference. And if you understand what's taking place now, what they saw is true. Ministers before, they saw UFOs. They did see prophecy, but they did not put it in his order. And when you put it in his order, you understand that there's never been a time when these, happen, that these things happen like this. And why is it happening now? That 2015, very serious year. Heavenly Father, as we take these last few minutes to bring it to a close, help us to see, Lord, if ever there was a time to get ready, it's now. Please, Lord. 
In Jesus' name, amen. You know what this is right here? You know what that man is right there? You forgot that man, didn't you? He was just here last week. He came to a city near you in Atlanta. You know what the name of this, his, 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 his campaign was? Make America. You know what this man is? This man is the new Nebuchadnezzar. Do you know that just before Babylon fell, there was another man that talked like that. He walked out over his kingdom and he said, is this not great Babylon that I have what built? Now, do you know that that wasn't the first time Babylon was built? That Nimrod on the tower of the plains of Shinar, Genesis 11, he built the tower of Babel. It's the same Babylon. And so Nebuchadnezzar rebuilt and made Babylon great again. Now, my brothers and sisters, that was his statement just prior to the fall of Babylon. Now, my brothers and sisters here, the president comes on the scene and he says, let's make America what? This happens just before the collapse, just before the fall of Babylon. The second angel says, Babylon is fallen. Someone has to preach it like Daniel before it takes place. And I'm standing here today to tell you that America is getting ready to reach its limit. Now, my brothers and sisters, if he said, let's make America great again, my question is, you have to point to a time when America was great. What time are you pointing to to speak of the greatness of America? What was going on before you get excited about that? You better understand what he's talking about. Something happened to make America so great. Something happened to make America so rich so fast. Something happened. And it was on the backs of slavery. You know what it would take to make America like that again? My brother and sister, you know what happened in America? Once America got that divided, something broke out called a civil war. Something broke out called a revolution. My brother and sister, you better understand something. Something is coming to America. We're sitting around here playing around, thinking everything's all right, giving our children toys and fairy tales. It's time to get our children ready for the coming of the Lord. I don't know how a man can give his child some veggie tales and they came up with all this other foolishness today. How are you going to have a cucumber getting your child ready for what's coming? How can a carrot help the child get ready? I mean, what the carrot's going to say to the child? My brothers and sisters, when we look at this, you know this man right here, the Pope, have they ever met before, yes or no? Yeah, they met before. Now, my brothers and sisters, something is happening. Why the fall of the American Empire will come by what? Everybody, every field of knowledge is telling us. Now, look what the historian says. <coughs> Living in such tents and mercurial times, it's easy to see that what? Most Americans do not have a strong confidence in their country's future, with about 60% thinking it's headed in the wrong direction, according to a poll. They are sharply what? Divided by politics. And the house divided, it can't what? Stand, it's going to fall. By the role America should play in the world, but how to utilize science and education. All such sentiment is not only warranted, but indicates the reality that America is in its what? It's getting ready to reach its limit. The historian knows it. The thinking men know it. Look what he says. He says he laid out the vision. McCoy says, the historian, the election of what? Donald Trump's presidency as a defining moment. He does not think Trump himself is the cause, but rather a what? Symptom. Nonetheless, he regards Trump as one who's going to what? Hasten. And my brother and sister, you better understand, you know what opened up today on the Hill, on Washington? You know what happened today? The impeachment inquiry. Do you know what this means prophetically? This means something for the Day of Atonement. What does it mean? This, this tells us that Jesus is getting ready to finish in the most holy place. And my brother and sisters, we don't understand because we have gotten spiritual amnesia. We've lost our identity. You know what this means? It means that judgment is about to pass from the dead to the living. Do you know that in 1844, the judgment started with the dead? That's the beginning of the Day of Atonement. But the Day of Atonement can't end until judgment passes from the dead to the living. But I want to ask you a question. What was on the bottom of the priest's garment? A bell and a... Now, we don't get there, so I'm stretching to bring you there. <laughs> In Exodus, you read the priest's garment. On the bottom of the priest's garment was a bell and a... Now, every time a priest moved, guess what sounded as the priest moved in the sanctuary? Guess what went off? Talk to me. A bell. 
So when Jesus moved from the outer court to the holy place, the bell sounded. When Jesus moved from the holy place to the most holy place, October 22nd, 1844, guess what happened? The bell sounded. Heavenly Father, as we get ready to bring it to a close, please help every movement to stop. This is too serious. I pray, dear God, as we get ready to close, that you will show us if ever there was a time for us to see, Lord, that nothing is more important than this. We have nowhere to go but to see that we're ready to meet you. Please, dear God, help us to understand right now that whatever we do, we must do quickly. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. When Jesus moves in the sanctuary, what sounds on the bottom of his garment? A bell. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that these prophetic events are an indication to us that that bell is getting ready to sound. The judgment of the living is about to begin, but guess what? What condition must we be in when the judgment of the living starts? Sinless. Sinless. Are we in that condition right now? Do, is there a great work that must be done right now? But my brothers and sisters, do you know that there's a part for us to play? It's not going to happen by ourselves. The Bible tells us that there are three things that must happen. But my time is gone. And what I'm going to do right now is tell us this. Tomorrow, no, there's no tomorrow, no, tomorrow night. So you're in trouble. You see that? I'm going to tell you something. I don't know how far we're going to get. The limit is almost here. You better make it up in your mind tonight. Whatever changes that must be made. I've got to get to know Jesus. And the only reason why we won't know him is because there's no room for him. You know what Jesus is doing? He's standing at the door of our heart, and guess what he's doing? But you know what it's like? He's standing at the door knocking. You know, if, if your house has ever been so cluttered before, you try to open the door, but you can't open it because every, the couch in the way. You try to open the door, and you can't even move, open the door up. And you know, in everybody's house, generally, there's one room that they don't want you to go into. Now, you don't have to smile. I know it's the truth. And if you doubt what I say, when you go home tonight, you'll know that I'm right. <laughs> Every house generally has a room in which they don't want anyone to go in. They have visitors sometimes. Visitors come in. They see that room. Oh, it looks nice. Living room. You go, oh, this room looks nice. But there's one room that just before everybody comes in, you take all that stuff and just... <laughs> That's the way it is in the heart. Sometimes we let them into some room. We'll let them in sometimes to the refrigerator and we'll change our diet, but we won't let them into the closet and change our dress. We won't let them take off things off our face and off our hands and off our bodies. We won't let them come into our cars and change the music we listen to. We won't let them in every room in the house. We'll say, Lord, you can come into this part, but you can't come into this part of my life. But in order to be ready for the crisis, you know what we must do to all those doors? We must throw open every door and say, Lord, you have access to every part of my life. And when Jesus can take that which is unclean and unpure and, un and sinful, not only from the books, but from the heart and life of the believer, he can bring us back to a place where we can know him as a close, intimate, and personal friend. Why? Because there's nothing between my soul and the Savior. We want to see his blessed face. What do you say? Amen. There's something in our hearts or life tonight that you say, Lord, it's got to go. It's got to go. That's your desire tonight. You want to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Would you reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer? <laughs> Heavenly Father, the crisis is here. We shouldn't be moving, Lord. We're thinking right now that we're not ready. Help us, Lord, to see that there's nothing more important than giving our life to you, our heart to you. Opening up that you may come into every room to make radical changes. Not tomorrow. Tonight. That there are some things that we must do tonight. Decisions tonight. In marriages. There are, are women today that have boyfriends that they need to cut off tonight. Boyfriends, they have girlfriends that are sending them in the wrong direction into the bed of fornication. They need to cut off tonight. 
Whether it's on the internet, whether it's right here in this room, tonight there's somebody that is holding on to a sin that they've got to let go tonight. And Father, we need you because we cannot do this by ourselves. In fact, I pause the prayer. There's someone here tonight that says, Lord, you're talking to me. You spoke to me. There's something in my heart that needs to come out that I'm holding on to. I'm struggling, but I know there needs to be a change. And I need your help. I want to know you, dear God. My family, young person, adult, you want to change tonight. Just raise your hand wherever you are by saying, dear God, I need you. I want to be drawn back to you. I want to be closer to you. I want to start over. I want to be not ashamed to stand no matter what anyone else does. I want to stand for Jesus. You're raising your hand. Father, I'm raising my hand, please. Not just because I'm preaching. I want you tonight, Lord. I told you this even before today. I reminded you to this today, Lord. I, I want you. I want you to save my home and this church, Lord, this precious church. Save every member from the pastor down to the last visitor. Help us, Lord, to accept Jesus. But Lord, you're not going to force us. You cannot force us. If we will be saved, it's because we would have made a choice. And so, Father, be with every lifted hand. If there's any hand not lifted, I pray that you would agitate the heart before it is too late. We thank you, Lord, for we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated for a silent moment of meditation. Amen. Are you happy you're here tonight? Amen. Did you learn anything? Yes. Do you want some more? Yes. Tomorrow night, there's no meeting. You, 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 you need to be praying. Say, dear God, I wish that I had done some things. See, we, we missed the whole night. We, we, we can't get it back. You need to be praying. Lord, help us to get ready. And then, brothers and sisters, we'll come back here to uh, Friday night. What time? Ah, not 6.58 now. That was 6.57. <laughs> we need it. Sabbath will come. We, we, we need some experience because we need as much as we can get. We don't have much time left. Something is happening. We need to get ready. What do you say? So Friday night, 6.57, let's pray for each other. Amen? Amen. And the meeting on Thursday, or no meeting Thursday, but look over your notes. Review so that when we come back Friday night, we can take off and get as fast as God can take us. Somebody's asked for these materials out front. Our booth is set up where we will have some of the DVDs that go into some of the things that went back into the past to explain. So you can stop it, rewind it, take notes, go back through it. My brothers and sisters, we need to get ready for the coming of the Lord. What do you say? Amen. You may consider yourself dismissed. I'll be praying for you as you pray for me. We'll see you tomorrow night by God's grace, a Friday night, Friday night at 6.57. God bless you. You may consider yourself dismissed.